open educational resources is really a, and began as and remains a grassroots movement. Um, and the governance officials of education at all levels uh, haven't been very involved for the most part. Uh, I wonder if any of you might speculate about, first of all, why it is that the open educational resources movement is and remains mostly a grassroots movement. And then what might happen if the policymakers who are responsible for governing educational institutions here in the United States actually got involved? Paul, maybe you have some thoughts? <laughs> sure. I actually think of open policy as having an individual level of choice. So I do think, Hal, it's interesting to note that it started as a grassroots initiative because in some ways you can personally choose to take an action to be open and not require government or institutional authority, which I think has been a very powerful moving force in this field. I do think that that's resulted in this kind of tremendous grassroots initiative that only now we're starting to see some top senior institutional and government level initiatives matching that. And I guess part of where I speculate things might go is that we might see a shift from the default being closed to the default being open. And, and I think that's where uh, kind of a, a larger, maybe a, at a federal level, uh, as we see happening with the TAC grant and other grants, um, those kind of policies really would help, I think, make that, close that gap. But maybe it's an awareness gap with, with leaders or um, maybe uh, it's, it's just the fact that it's gotten their attention and kind of at this level and, and, and they need to respond to it. But I think, I think we really need to show that beyond kind of a, an instructional piece, which is of course very important and the affordability piece is very important, that uh, the OER certainly can serve kind of broader institutional goals, strategic goals. And, and I, I think that's what the, the leaders of our institutions really need to see um, to, to, to make the kind of policy changes we need. What's happening in the world of open policy that might have an impact on some of these issues? So I think one of the most exciting things that's happening at the governmental level uh, is that countries are adding open policy as part of their open government plans. And seeing open policy and, and open educational resources as a way to make government more open. Um, the United States is the first country to add open educational resources as part of its open government national action plan. And by making a broad statement uh, in support of open education, it really cleared a lot of barriers in terms of how we're talking about open policy and open education on campuses and even within government. And it's interesting to see that a lot of other countries around the world are starting to take these steps. Uh, countries like Poland and Slovakia have national uh, policies or initiatives uh, related to open education and I think that international collaboration uh, around open policy is uh, a mirror of what's happening on campuses. I think in some ways too, having, uh, having policy, whether it came before the project or as the project developed, is a way of uh, really validating the work of those grassroots people and making them feel like the work that they're doing is valued by senior administrators in their institution and therefore might help them on if they're on a tenure track or something like that where uh, at other points without policy it's a bigger risk for faculty to engage in, in this kind of um, different way of thinking about resources. I think it's, it's a good question. What can policy at the federal and state level do to help continue the momentum that, that's, that's going on right now. And I think Paul is right that there's a lot that can happen and has happened without that policy. But still, we need to have the conversation what, what can be done. And a piece of information I think that's core to the conversation is hearing the impact on the front line, hearing directly from students. Uh, in our case, you know, the student who had to choose between buying gas or, going, or buying the book to go to class or the faculty member who, for the first time, knows that the students in her course have the materials on day one. There's no reason to not have the materials. You know, we don't have students waiting for aid to pay for a book. They come prepared that first day. You know, so what can policy do to help, help us embed that at an institutional level that, that's not happening right now? There, there are a couple of layers of policy. There are uh, uh, departmental policies, institutional policies, state policies, uh, federal policies. Um, 
but what role does government have to play in open educational resources? Why, why should the government care at all and, and be involved in this? What, what skin does the government have in the game vis-a-vis -vis open policies? I can give you one example from Tidewater. Uh, in the second year of our pilot, we looked at, with our bookstore vendor, how much money students spent on textbooks. In one year's time at one college, three semesters, there was just under $12 million spent on textbooks. About two-thirds of that was, was aid money of some sort. You know, so it's roughly $7 million at one institution of aid money spent on textbooks. I would say the government has a lot of skin in the game. I think a critical role for government in terms of having skin in the game is about stewarding public funds effectively and being accountable to the public for the use of taxpayers' dollars. And I think openness gives government an opportunity to do that in a really effective way that affects students, affects the public, affects all of us, really. So the government invests in research and education for the betterment of society to create jobs, uh, fuel the economy, spur innovation, and uh, right now, today we have the technology to be able to accelerate that so much faster by sharing knowledge and information over the internet. And the thing is that the policies that we have today were created for a world that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and I think that's really where the role of government can be in shifting policies to make sure that they open up uh, all of these pathways that we have through technology and the internet to share information, uh, to make sure that we're getting the maximum benefit out of our research and education investments. And I think back to your point about jobs, um, in British Columbia, part of the investment has been made um, to produce textbooks in areas where we have skills gaps in the province. And so that increased access uh, to education in programs that will help lead to qualified uh, employees is, is obviously uh, a, a big role for government and, and very important. I think, Mary, too, uh, kind of more broadly, um, a concern that, that institutional leaders have in, in Virginia and, and I think across the United States is uh, outcomes gen and generally, com and kind of completion. Um, community colleges at least have done a great job of uh, providing access. Uh, we haven't done such a great job with you know, getting students through, through, to their kind of educational goals and, and what we've seen, a real, I think a real great promise of uh, openness in general and open educational resources is um, allowing students, uh, as Daniel mentioned, having the, having the materials on the first day of class, not having that as a barrier and allowing them to uh, kind of at least eliminate one of those barriers of affordability in a course so that they can uh, hopefully, and, and, and I think we're seeing this, you know, reach their, their goals and, and some form of credential. When we think about open policy though, uh, how does that change government's role? What, what are the hallmarks of a government policy with regard to open and and how is government's role different or will it be different in the future than it's been in the past I think part of that is um, is, is an enabling role rather than a thou shalt kind of role and so I, I think we would all agree that uh, maintaining that academic freedom for faculty who are the subject experts to make choices about which resources they want to use in their courses. Um, we want to continue with that, but again, having government policy that both enables that and gives students choice because there are more resources available um, and enables the, the, the student to achieve those outcomes, I think that's, that's a win-win for everybody. I think a really big change has been what Nicole was alluding to in terms of technology's impact on all of this, because I do think it's changed the game. Um, we no longer really need to work on the presumption of scarcity. And we know that we can create copies of works and distribute those works and store those works for almost zero dollars. And if that's the game, that you can do that now for almost zero dollars, to have policy in place that artificially creates scarcity, I think is it's close to morally wrong. Let me try out a theory on you. Um, uh, in the old days, government policy with regard to education, uh, in, in a, just a, in its barest form, was that people would pay taxes 
and some of those taxes would go to support educational activities and so we would build brick and mortar schools and um, libraries and public facilities um, but in the last 20 or 30 years as software and the software industry took off more and more government resources have gone uh, to buy uh, digital goods and services that the public doesn't own so no uh, durable goods are being created. No renewable uh, assets are being created with an increasing share of our tax dollars. Instead, those tax dollars are going to fatten the profits of a handful of uh, big software companies. So I, I think uh, Paul's point about artificial scarcity uh, makes a lot of sense here. Uh, in, in the old world, it used to be the case if the gov government funding was used to build an educational resource or buy an educational resource that the only way to get that to students was to go through a publisher that could print and bind it and ship it to, to those students and for every student you wanted to educate you had to print, ship, uh, and purchase a new book. But in today's world if government funding is used to create an educational resource it's possible to share that resource not only with the students for whom it was intended but with the entire world at the same time. And I think that this is a place where government policy can play a really critical role in making sure that when public funding is used to create resources of value, uh, that those resources be available to the public that paid for it. Because the benefits that are possible today uh, far outstrip what, what has ever been possible before. And I think we've already seen significant advances in public policy uh, around this in the research space. Uh, both uh, through uh, institutions adopting open access policies advocated by faculty in their libraries that make sure that when research is conducted on the campus that that research is available uh, to people on the campus and free to the public. And there's also been governmental policy uh, making sure that when the government funds research that the outcomes of that research is available to the public that paid for it so that people can not only learn from it, but actually build upon it and innovate around it, which is why we make those investments in the first place. I think there's, there's the macro level of this discussion and there's also the micro level of it, and that's where the right to retain digital materials um, by students who purchase them uh, or, or get them as an OER comes into play because if you purchase a textbook that's a hardcover, you have it in your hands and you can keep it, sell it, reuse it, etc. But there's been a real move by publishers in the education space particularly to give digital materials to students for a semester or a year and then they have no way of recouping their costs, reusing that resource later on, sharing it with other people who also want to, to learn the same materials and so I think that's where there's a role for policy to be played in terms of an institution or a government's expectation of what a publisher can and can't do in that experience exchange with students. So open educational resources not only through the cost savings uh, side of things but also through the increased outcomes. Uh, more students getting their degrees in less time and more institutions being able to serve more students. Uh, that really contributes to making sure that uh, we have a well-educated and productive uh, economy and workforce in society. So, so then what can I do at the institution level to make that happen? Well, we're figuring that out. What can the next level help to make that happen? And one example is we've talked a lot about the TAC grant. There's plenty of content on the soft science, the liberal arts side. We struggle to find content on the career side. And many of those programs lead to and have an impact on the economy where the jobs are, where, where, where we need people. We need content in those areas, and I think the government can help open up access to that content, can maybe uh, encourage the creation of new content where it's needed. It may, uh, we could encourage collaboration, ways I heard you speak about earlier, that, that we need a lot more of, not just within institutions, but across institutions, across states, uh, across governments. I think another aspect of this that I, that I always think of is that well, one of the things we're talking about is making better utilization of what we already have. We, we often talk about openness as sort of a grant program that ends up initiating some open resources, but really there's nothing stopping us from taking existing resources we already have and making them open. 
And by making them open, we increase not only access, but potentially use and improvement and enhancement and a broader cross-section of society having uh, the ability to learn from all of those things. The, the ripple effect is quite enormous. And so I think that while we all have been advocates and passionate advocates for sort of new open initiatives, I always am a bit surprised that we don't look at what we already have and think about mm -hmm. how might we make this open and what might be the impact of that. So when talking about policy, I think it's always important to think about uh, what role policy can play in actually achieving the kind of outcomes that we want to achieve and thinking about policy as a tool to enable that. And we started out this conversation talking about uh, the open education movement being fundamentally a grassroots movement. And I think uh, what everybody has said here really illustrates that there are both great things happening on the ground and progress happening uh, in policy. And I think as we think about how to move forward, it's thinking about how policy can complement what's happening on the ground and help forge connections and find opportunities and when necessary provide inducements or encouragements to move in, in a good direction.